A false teacher, though, is a different thing because it's a battle. You're actually engaging in spiritual battle. A misguided believer isn't battle in that sense. So you're not coming against the enemy. You're probably coming against one of the Lord's own. And so you need to come as a shepherd. And a shepherd guides and directs. It doesn't, it doesn't hack with the sword. Welcome to the Sound Words Podcast, where it's our goal to help Christians love and live out God's Word. Today, we are sitting down with Dr. Richard Vargas, the Executive Director of IFCA. Welcome to the Sound Words Podcast. Thank you. It's great to be sitting down with you today. Uh, we're going to be asking Dr. Vargas about false teachers versus misguided believers. What's the difference between the two? How do we interact with each of those groups? Yeah, sober and sobering topic and yes. subject. I mean, we grieve those who are entrapped in false systems of religion. Uh, we also know that, that that pendulum can swing either way where maybe we're a little too quick to on the draw mm -hmm. to identify somebody who might be misguided yes. and call them a false teacher. Um, so Dr. Vargas, you're the man for the next half hour. <laughs> Help us walk through these topics. And let's start just with the basic question. Mm -hmm. Biblically speaking, what are the marks of a false teacher? Yeah, that's an interesting question because, uh, you know, if you're a false teacher, then you're really not wanting to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to be identified. And so you're trying to, you know, go under the radar as long as you can. I, I think scripture is pretty helpful with this. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that a false teacher is uh, an agent of Satan and Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Yeah. And so that's what makes it a challenge. And that's why sometimes we might misunderstand somebody that's misguided and seems to be saying false things and identify them as a false teacher. And they may be teaching false things, but that might not be intentional. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's good. Second Corinthians uh, tells us that these deceitful teachers, these false apostles are what we need to be on the alert for. And so I think Second Peter chapter 2 is probably a great place to find a lot of indicators or marks that are there. And so I wrote down a few of them, and uh, I'm not going to read all the passages, but I've got seven marks, if, if I might. One of them is in verse 1, where they secretly introduce heresies. In other words, they're, they're trying to figure out the most palatable way of bringing something across that isn't uh, overt, it's not shocking, it's going to be nuanced. And that's a one way that false teachers often introduce yeah. these things is through the call for everybody to seek for nuance. Now, I, I believe nuance is important. We don't want to be unnecessarily offensive. We don't want to be sharp and kind of the immature. Sometimes everything's black and white and there's no shades in between. And there are sometimes. But nuance is an easy way to hide as well as and say, well, we're just saying it a little bit different. Oh, you just don't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, when you grow a little bit longer in the Lord, you'll know. And so uh, secretly is the way these guys work. Mm -hmm. uh, another mark that we give, are given there in verse two is that there is uh, the way that it shows up in their life. It might be that they're teaching good things or at least apparently good things because they're hiding them, but their life, uh, Peter writes, is licentious. It, it, it's going to be wild. They're going to live in ways that are a challenge to us as Christians where we're not going to see the purity and the righteousness in their life. We're going to say, wait a minute, I, I don't understand. You, you live this way. Doesn't doesn't the Bible say that? Oh, well, that, that's again, nuance. We You don't understand. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the Bible says you shouldn't do that. It's just... And we hear the almost the hiss of the snake in the background in their answer. And you're thinking, it doesn't line up. They say they're a Christian, and yet they do these things in their life. And that's troubling. And it, and it should be a mark, an indicator, is maybe this is a false teacher that I'm dealing with. The third verse tells us that they might exhibit greed. And that would be the reason why they're seeking to exploit other people. They're... Uh, maybe solely interested in money or it might be other things. It might not just, just be a financial gain, but they're looking to figure out how they can manipulate people, how they can maneuver them and get into the right position. So oftentimes that'll push them to get in positions of authority or prominence within the church. Once they can do that, then they can, you know, exert more influence, more power, and maybe get to a place where they could fulfill that lust that they have 
for whatever it is that they want. Sometimes it is money. You'll find oftentimes that um, people will say, well, you're, you know, you're always about money, you preachers, you pastors, you're always about money. And really what it is, is they're reflecting on the false teachers that they've run into. Yep. And they're seeing them on TV with their white shoes and their white suits. Or preachers and sneakers. Preachers, yeah, I was yeah. just thinking about that. <laughs> that. That's the old school Benny Hinn kind of way, but then there's the new ones and, and they've got just the glamorous look. They've got the, the super star look to them, the celebrity look and they're eventually going to get some money. And so that's another good sign. God's word says a lot about money. We have to teach about money. One of the reasons why we preach through the Bible is because it helps us to not avoid the things that might be a little embarrassing to teach about. Money is one of them for really good, solid Bible teachers that we don't want to always be about money because we don't want to look like a false teacher. False teachers don't seem to avoid that. They seem to go right to that very often. The fourth Uh, mark that you might find is they despise authority. And when they despise authority, it's from the authority of the word of God. And oftentimes that's reflected in their despising of the authority of those that are over them in the church. That might be elders or other kinds of leaders. Uh, Verse 10 tells us that they don't want anybody to tell them what to do. And so oftentimes when a, a church leader comes to them and says to them, You really need to um, listen to what we're saying here. We're trying to help you. Maybe you think they're misguided. And so you start to speak to them from the word of God and say, this is not what it says. And you're being gentle as a shepherd, yet you might find that there's a lot of pushback because they don't want the authority. Uh, The fifth mark that I found there in in 2 Peter chapter 2 is their self-willed. And that's part of this idea that they don't want anybody to tell them what to do is they want to do what they want to do. They aren't going to listen to anybody except for themselves. And so, again, the word of God isn't their supreme authority. They may use it. They may manipulate it to get what they want, but it's not going to have any rule over them. And nobody in the church is going to have that kind of authority. Mm. If we were to cross-reference false teachers in the Bible, you often find that feature really shows up. Uh, Paul was constantly dealing with these so-called super apostles who didn't want to listen. We have supposed apostles today that have enough guts to actually walk into a church and tell the pastor, I'm the apostle over this church. And you think, this is ridiculous. I don't even know who you are. And yet they think that somehow they have ultimate authority over the church and yet they aren't teaching from the word of God. They're just kind of pulling this out of the air. Uh, The sixth one is they will speak arrogantly. As they're speaking arrogantly, they come across with confidence. At least that's what it sounds like to those that are unknowing of who they are. They're going to speak with uh, a great authority, like the person that comes in and says, I'm an apostle and you need to give your ministry over to me. It's kind of shocking, but they might do that to a layman, somebody that's sitting in the pew and tell them, "Uh, the Lord spoke to me in a prophecy and you need to do this. You need to marry that person. You need to take that job. You need to give me this money. And because the person's flustered, they don't know that this is a false teacher. They, They may listen to what they have to say, and we need to be very careful about that. They're completely ignorant, verse 18 tells us, of those spiritual matters, and yet they'll speak with confidence as if they know what they're talking about. Interestingly enough, a lot of false teachers have no Bible training, yeah. and yet they speak as if they know more than the guys that have gone to school and have studied the Word of God faithfully and have the experience behind them to know how to pastor a church. They'll come off as, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, he went to cemetery and things like that, and yet they don't really know what they're talking about. False teachers fit into that category a lot. And then finally, the last mark I'll mention, there's lots of them in scripture is verse 19 tells us that they enslave people. That's really one of the goals that they have. They promise things. They set out before them all kinds of promises of this is what will happen if you listen to me, if you follow my teaching, if you leave this church, and that's their ultimate goal is to pull people out of the church and build around them a little kingdom for themselves. Uh, They will promise everything. And what they only give them is enslavement, usually enslavement to sin, Mm-hmm. That Jesus has already set them free, but they will re-enslave them into those things so that they're no longer following God, they're following a man. Yeah. And so these are all really good reasons to stay away from false teachers, but they're also marks where you start watching the activity of uh, a person, whether that's uh, on TikTok or on YouTube or in the church, and you say, well, the person that I love listening to has many of those marks. 
then that's a good sign that they're probably a false teacher. Mm. Yeah, that's really good because I think sometimes we think of false teachers being only on TV, right. health and wealth pre preachers, the prosperity gospel, but you're right. They're in our social media. They're in our, our books. They're in yeah. uh, you know other forms of media. So identifying them is essential. Scripture says a lot about false teachers. And in many of the New Testament books, you're talking about Second Peter, Jude, First John. Thank you for, for going through and, that list. And it's essential, um, of course, be biblically faithful and understand what God has revealed to us, but just the great harm that yeah. is caused. That's what you identified as I heard those marks over and over, yeah. the great harm that can be done uh, by, by one who's a false teacher. I mean, I can't help but think of the just being reburdened, not under the Mosaic law, but under the law of this person. Yeah. Can't think of the help, help but think of the term millstones. I mean, these are, these are um, wicked people ultimately who are misleading God's people or misleading yeah. unsaved people and, and taking them off a cliff. So it's very yeah. sad. Yeah. Now, going to our other term for our podcast title, false teachers versus misguided believers. Now, what is a misguided believer and how do we identify them? Yeah. And this is a, a role that the shepherd needs to have in his ministry, which is uh, really falls under the idea of discernment, mm -hmm. is that uh, that's the reason why scripture calls pastors and teachers and leaders to be uh, men of discernment of the word, that they understand the word, not just in its content, but the application of the word. Because, you know, a person that's been abused by a false teacher is often wounded. And sometimes they're so confused that they don't know what's right and wrong. They don't know. They've been exposed to the twisting of scripture and they're not sure what is the wheat and what is the chaff. And so they come to us filled with wrong ideas and they may be misguided and we might interpret them as a false teacher. So we have to be very careful because oftentimes they're very wounded. Sometimes the misguided are the immature. They are young in the faith or they're long-term in the church, but they haven't been taught adequately for whatever reason that might be. And they might be new to our church, but they have been in churches for a long, long time and should be more mature. And maybe even will tell you, I've been going to church. I became a believer in Awana when I was, you know, eight years old and they're, you know, they're, they're in their forties and fifties or whatever. And you're thinking, oh, this is a mature believer. And you realize they're very misguided and we might identify them from being in the church so long that they're false teachers. And so we, we need to be careful. And, um, so they're, they're, one of the marks is that they're immature and immature in their understanding. And oftentimes it'll show in their kind of their character is they're just not what we would look at and say, that's a very sanctified, holy, godly believer. We see much in their lifestyle that would make us think this is a, this is a good, strong believer. Uh, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to go to, to Fiji to do a pastor's conference there. And um, while I was there, I was informed that they don't call it a pastor's conference. They call it a Christian leaders conference. And so I inquired why they had changed the idea. And they said, because on Fiji, there are a lot of liberal seminaries and there are a lot of liberal churches that, that have women pastors. And that some of these women pastors come to the Bible conference to learn. And so the follow-up question was, well, are these women pastors pastors because they've been untrained and they don't know better or they've been trained and they know all Rebelling. the arguments. Yeah. Okay. And, and they're arguing against scripture by twisting the scripture to say what it doesn't say. And the answer I was happy to hear came back. They're untrained. They don't know better. Hmm. Okay. So they're, they're what we're talking about in this category is misguided. Yep. So they may be the pastor of the church, but they don't know that they're not supposed to be the pastor of the church. So I was informed. So you go ahead and teach what the Bible says but you need to know there are going to be women there and don't teach anything differently. The tact was we train them from the scripture as they learn and mature and grow. They leave that idea of being a woman pastor and then submit to the word of God and then do whatever God calls them to do that's not outside of scripture. And so that's a great uh, paradigm for us to think about it is the misguided person isn't trained to twist the scripture like the false teacher is. They don't understand it. They, they may be aware of it, but they're not clear about how to teach it. So they often express a desire to know God, what God's word teaches, and they want to interpret it correctly, but they don't know how. Hmm. So that's a misguided Christian. Is They, they may have come out of maybe a, a charismatic church and they come to you and sincerely say, well, pastor, would you pray with me? And as they're praying with you, they may start to speak in tongues. 
Now, are they trying as a false teacher to introduce to you a doctrine that maybe your church doesn't teach, or are they just a young believer who doesn't know? And then once you tell them, oh, we don't do that here. Oh, I'm sorry. Why not? They're not rebellious. They're not trying to be divisive. They just don't know. They haven't been well taught. And it wouldn't take very long for that kind of a person to be introduced to what the Bible says and then to cling to that. Mm -hmm. And and that's great. Um, They're often confused by conflicting opinions. So because they're young and they don't have a lot of discernment, they've been listening to this guy's podcast and this guy's sermons. They've been watching this guy and reading this guy, and they've been just soaking up whatever comes and including some false teaching. And so because they're confused about that, they will trust a lot of people they shouldn't trust. And so the misguided often are influenced by false teachers, and yet they've done it innocently. They don't know any better. And then the misguided also are usually, uh, as a character trait, they're usually teachable. They're usually very humble when you show them biblical proof. Uh, False teachers are not that. We already heard that they're not that. And so you might be able to sit down with them and say, let me show you what the Word of God says. Now, they may have follow-up questions. If they were abused by a false teacher, they hopefully will have learned from that lesson and will say, "Uh, Pastor, but I don't understand. So-and-so said this. Well, take it for what it is. They're asking good, solid questions, and they need you to help them sift out all of that chaff that they've accepted at one time and realize anything that guy taught, I'm not sure if I should believe it, but you said something similar. I don't want to follow you, and you're a false teacher too. And so they're misguided. We we need to show them patience, and usually they're teachable, but this is the source of authority. And so we need to make sure that we keep pointing them back to this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, how about in terms of salvation? We're calling this this category misguided believers. Yeah. Would you say the false teachers are unbelievers according to scripture when they're listed as false teachers? Yeah, I, I would yeah. say absolutely. I, I think that there might be some people that are teaching false things that are misguided. So they may be having a home Bible study and then they're going through some curriculum they picked up and and it's bad. Or they may come out of a tradition that we definitely wouldn't agree with on where they land on lots of things. And so we would say, well, that might be a believer who's misguided and teaching some error, but they don't know it. And we'll look at some examples, hopefully. But here's the reality is false teachers most of the time know they're false teachers because of the motive behind it. This motive that says, I want to take advantage. I want to use people. I want to get for myself. I don't believe this stuff. They're the hucksters. They're the, they're the, the ones that are using God's word and religion in general, and they're in all religions. They're there just to make a buck or to, to get the glory or whatever it is. Misguided people are believers and they're genuine, but sometimes they might even be unbelievers at that moment, but only because they don't know enough. And so we might want to sit down with them and share the gospel, or they may not know a lot of the the deeper things of God that we want to sit down and at least help them grasp it. They're like, they might not understand the concept of the Trinity. And so we might need to sit down with them because they might have some kind of modalistic idea of what the Trinity is. And that's false, but they don't know that yet. So we don't want to anathematize them. We just need to give them more instruction. Right? That was Jesus's command to us in the Great Commission, right? To teach them all. And it takes a while to teach them what they need to know. So we need to be patient and careful and kind and loving. But we also need to draw a line when we know that they're being destructive. And not only are they being destructive, but they're introducing destructive heresies to the church. And then we need to act in a different way because they're not misguided. They're, they're terrorists in the church. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's out of bounds at all to use such aggressive language like that, yeah. the terroristic language. I mean, that's what we see all over the scripture. I mean, yeah. I think of the book of Jude and the, use, the words he uses to describe false teachers. And I, I appreciate that question, Aaron, from a salvation standpoint, because we are talking about uh, those who actively portray or present false teaching. Even the, yeah. the word self-willed that you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier suggest activity, um, intention, malice behind what they're doing. They're, they're misleading those who are truly false teachers. Those who are misguided, even that word miss, you know, misunderstood, misguided has more of a passive sense to mm-hmm. it. They, they've accumulated whatever they have in the moment, but they're teachable, like you yeah. mentioned, and they, they might be willing to be corrected, which is a helpful dividing line between the two groups. Mm-hmm. Now, you did mention examples, and we yeah. do want to get into, into some examples. So maybe broad question here. Do we have some scriptural examples of either type, the false teacher or the misguided believer? And then how do we see the apostles or the early church addressing either camp? Yeah. 
And I, and I think it's helpful for us to think that the fact is, even for both groups, there, there are degrees, especially mm-hmm. false teachers, there are degrees of false teachers and their motives for seeking what they want. You know, it's uncomfortable for us to say it sometimes because we think about all the issues that have happened with uh, the Church of Jesus Christ and Judaism. But the reality is that most of the aggressors for the early church were Jews, not all the Jewish people, right. uh, because the early church was Jewish to begin with. So it wasn't a racial thing. But if you think about all the Jewish religious leaders that were against Jesus and his followers, they were teaching things that were not even in alignment with Judaism in many times. And they weren't looking for riches necessarily out of their followers. They were looking to influence them, to pressure them. They would throw them out of the synagogue. They wanted the prestige. It tells us they were jealous. They didn't want to lose what they had. And so they were really doing it for a different motive than, than money of many of what we're familiar with with false teachers. Then you go to something like First and Second Corinthians, where Paul is dealing with these super apostles, these false apostles, and there we're finding that they very much are looking at the the growing wealth and influence, and they kind of want the whole package. They want to get money, they want to get power, they want to have influence. Um, they're mocking the apostle Paul, and so they're a whole different matter, and they're somewhat different from the Jewish leaders who were leading the people in a different direction astray. And so you have also the false, in, in Second Peter, he talks about the false prophets and heretics, yep. those that are introducing completely foreign doctrine. So you've got the, the religious leaders who are, uh, in many ways, very parallel. And, and so taking out of the Jewish context, we would find that there's a lot of Christian groups, and we would say like uh, Roman Catholicism, it has a different gospel, but we would align in so many other places. And yet we would recognize that Roman Catholicism is a false teaching. It distorts the gospel of Jesus Christ. And therefore, it, its teachers and those that are its promoters and those that are pushing are actually false teachers themselves. But it's a very different thing from maybe a cult where the, the cult leader is trying to uh, gain a power over a people by having them be devoted followers, doing everything that he says, maybe multiple marriages, married, marrying children. We see that in the fundamentalist Mormon cults. Um, or maybe they're like the, the word of faith teachers where they're wanting to get money for themselves. All false teachers. Some of them are more interested in teaching heresy and destroying the faith of people. And others are more interested in just uh, gaining something for themselves. All of it is demonic, but they have different purposes. So I think when we break things up, we see that there are different degrees, different motives for getting what they desire, even different methodologies and how they do it. Yeah. 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 That's good. Now taking it to today's context, how should Christians interact with false teachers and misguided believers today? And can you give examples of what you've seen or or dealt with in the past or in, in recent times, I suppose that will help us here? Yeah, I think uh, a great biblical example that is a helpful one for us is in Acts 18, Priscilla and Aquila, who are followers of Jesus, who have met with the Apostle Paul, and they come across this guy named Apollos. Apollos is a misguided Christian. He he is uh, astounding in his ability to preach the word, and he knows a lot. And we don't exactly know what he didn't get right, but as they're listening to him, they're like, that was great but you're still a little bit off. And so they take him aside. And again, we see the humility in both Priscilla and Aquila and in Apollos, and they teach him more accurately, the scripture tells us. And he listens, and then and then he really takes off. And so I think that's a great example for us is that sometimes we will have people that will come and they have been taught outside of our own spheres, our own churches, and we can listen to them and we can hear what they're saying and going, that's great, except it's a little off. And then we need to invest the time in them. These really are uh, good things to invest our time in as a church and say, yes, we need to help the immature, the the young people in the faith and and help them grow as they become believers. But there's something to be said about also shaping those Christian workers who are close, but not quite there, because they'll take less time investment for us to be able to send them out or even to reinvest them. Apollos did this, reinvest back into the work of the church and bring them along and say, I got to go. I'm going to leave you here. And I know I can trust you because we helped with the little bit of things that were showing up in your ministry that you needed help with. Apollos is one of those. 
Peter was another one. Uh, as I was trying to think of, you know, this distinction, I, I couldn't find a single time where Peter didn't need some help. I mean, all the way through his ministry, Jesus having to constantly correct him. Yeah. And I think he's he stands out the most because I think a lot of the apostles agreed with him, but he was the one that would say something. And so he was the one that got in trouble the most, but Jesus always corrected him. Sometimes it was gentle, and that's a help for us, mm -hmm. is we need to be good in our discernment of what kind of error is this and what kind of influence is this going to have on other people. Sometimes it takes just a, a, a gentle speaking to and saying to them, you know, this is, this is not quite right. Let me show you where it says in the Word of God that this isn't good. And then there's sometimes when they enter into an area that's really dangerous and we need to really do something to get their attention that this is serious. Um, I have four little girls. I say little girls, they're all adult women now. But I remember when when my wife and I, you know, there's four of them. And you have one for each hand, but sometimes they just outnumber you. And so I taught them, when you're in the parking lot of a store, you need to stand against the car until we're all out. And then we all walk together. Because you know how dangerous it is, it is when they're oh, yeah. little and they're going to run out into the street and cars don't see them. And I remember one of them, one time, and it was only one time, <laughs> jetted out. And as fast as I could react, she was out of my reach, except she had her hair in a ponytail and it was flowing behind her. And what I could grab was her hair. <laughs> and I grabbed her hair and pulled her back in, avoiding a, a car hitting her. And she, of course, she didn't like it and she cried. And I apologize for pulling her hair, but... Once again, with a stern reminder, this is why you can't run out. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think for those that are immature and, and haven't grown in the faith, they don't always understand the dangers. And we have to sit down with them and something has to grab their attention. You don't know what's going on here, but this is very dangerous. Yeah. And they still may not conceive of the danger, but we need to be a little bit more in their face in those instances because the danger is more heightened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I there's, could, yeah, there's, I could uh, see why you you brought up Peter. I think in Galatians it yeah. says Paul opposed exactly, him to yeah. his face. Yeah, and so that is that uh, that harsher level of rebuke. Yeah, exactly. which is necessary when the issue is serious. Exactly, and he knew better at that point. Yeah. So you have to discern. Well, how much did Peter give away when he's doing this? Is is, is Peter actually against the gospel at that point? I don't think he is. Mm -hmm but he's leading other people and because he's so prominent. And that, yeah. that goes to this, the fact is we may have people that are in our leadership with us in a church who, you know, we trust them for the most part, but they're misguided in their understanding. And they think, well, it's not that big of a deal. And you, maybe as the elder or maybe as a pastor are saying, no, when I left my church in California, I, I gave the list a list of people we had put out of our church to our elders. I said, guys, you need to know this. Scripture is clear that when they struck Jesus, and he told his disciples this, when, when they strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. And I said, the wolves will come in. Paul warned in Acts 20, the wolves are going to come. The wolves are going to come back. They're going to recognize the shepherd's not there anymore. Here's a list of the guys. Watch for them. I didn't know if that would happen for sure, but I wanted to make sure that they were ready. And that's exactly what happened. They started coming back. Well, they didn't really put me out of the church. I didn't really get disciplined. I got calls. I said, let me forward you the words to the meeting that we had that we read publicly that clearly say they were disciplined for these sins. And I'd send it to them because they got befuddled. They're like, well, they're saying that they didn't actually get dealt with that way. No, they did. They did. And you, you're warning those leaders and saying, who are misguided, because you know the, the false teachers come in and they say things like, well, it was just a misunderstanding and we've missed the church and we've changed and oh, hold up. Because they're listening and going, well, maybe, maybe they have a point. No, they don't. And I, I think when you look at Peter's example in Galatians, I think that Peter didn't give away the farm, but he was on a track and he was also leading other people that would respond in a way that would be far worse than Peter did. That's why Paul and Barnabas were pointed out. It's like, you guys, what you're doing is going to lead people down a legalistic path. And these Judaizers are going to take them that way. You may not go that far, but they will. So, and then, and then there's, there's other passages. Uh, I think of the Corinthian church as well. Even, even Paul, when he's speaking to the believers in Acts 20 and 21, 
returning to Jerusalem. And some of them are saying, you can't go. And he's saying, you're breaking my heart. You're breaking my heart. And, and he's dealing with them. It's like, you, you don't understand. The Spirit has already revealed to me what's going to happen. I know. And then Agabus, hmm. you, 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 I know what's going on. Don't stop me from doing what God's called me to do. It's well-intentioned. And yet, he has to gently bring them alongside and say no. And then they let him go because they've been taught. So I, I think those are some good examples of um, misguided believers and I think it's some good examples of how we need to come alongside them and say, I know it sounds like I'm not doing the right thing. And I'm thankful that you're coming alongside me because maybe I am in error, but I don't think it in this case, and here's why, and we're helping shape and inform. Yeah, your biblical examples, as, as well as your experience and just the wisdom the Lord has given you to speak to these matters, really highlights why we're doing this podcast yeah. and this episode and really goes back to a real central question and, and a really a, a, and a matter of risk. And that's yeah. the next question I have for you is, what's the risk? So mm -hmm. what, what's the risk associated with getting these categories wrong? You know, marking that person who is actually a misguided believer as a false mm -hmm. teacher or vice versa? What mm -hmm. perils do we face if we go down that path? Yeah, um, I, th I think we need to think about whether or not, first of all, if you're just talking about the average Christian in the church, is the average Christian in the church needs to think about whether or not they should even engage, they should even be involved. Proverbs tells us, it's like you see a dog and and are you going to walk by the dog or, you, or like a little kid, grab him by the ears? You know, well, you know, wisdom says, especially a street dog in, in the days of the Old Testament, is you don't that dog might bite you that might dog it might have rabies you may not be able to handle what that dog is going to bring into this fight you don't know so don't get involved and sometimes people get involved with false teachers like you know you're a brand new christian and you've heard that you need to refute false teachers and then a a mormon shows up at your door a mormon missionary they will put you in a theological pretzel mm -hmm. if you don't know the word of god so should you get involved at this point in your maturity you need to think about it yeah they know that well if a, a jehovah's witness shows up at your door and you start to engage with the scriptures and they get befuddled and they they don't know what to do. If they do come back, they're going to come back with somebody that is more mature and well-versed in the scriptures, uh, in their scriptures and their doctrine. So we need to be wise and figure out, do I even need to engage this kind of person? Um, but there are lots of reasons why we should. And especially if you're more mature, um, there's a lot of reasons we might just run and hide. But, you know, that's not what God's called us to do. We're to engage. We don't want to be like a little girl who runs away from things that maybe she should run away from. As mature believers, we need to get in between the false teacher and the one that's being threatened. And so we really need to do that. So what I would say is we need to absolutely engage in this fight. I was walking, my family were camping, we were walking down this path and uh, a couple ladies with um, a stroller with a baby on it were walking on this path in front of us. And as we were walking, uh, I told my little girl, my youngest daughter, stay with us. But she kept running ahead. To this day, she still runs ahead of us on the paths. And uh, that day, she ran ahead and came screaming running back because right at the base of a tree, there was a rattlesnake. And she saw it and it scared her. To this day, she hates snakes. Came back. Um, my brother and I went and hunted down this rattlesnake, chased it, killed it. You know my brother, Pete. It was yeah. Pete and I. And... Um, we, we picked up some big rocks and then we, we eventually dispatched him. And one of the reasons wasn't just because, you know, we're guys thumping our chest and we're going to kill this snake, but because of those ladies that had come before us, mm. we knew they were going to come back down that path. And it had curled up at the base of a tree where you couldn't see it. And we thought, if they get surprised, they're going to get bit. And it was a big rattlesnake. Uh, I think about why we need to engage. It's not always just for us. It's oftentimes for those that are with us in our church. We need to engage them for that. And, and I would say the reasons along with why we need to do it are how we need to do it. We need to use our Bibles. That's got to be number one. Yeah. Use your Bible. And that requires you knowing your Bible. Mm -hmm. Just having a Bible isn't going to help you any. It's like having, you know, having a gun, but you don't know how to use it. If you don't know how to engage it if you don't know how to take the safety off if you don't even know how to check if you've got bullets or 
shot or anything, then it's worthless. You, unless you're going to club them with it. <laughs> you're going to have to know how to open your Bible and use it. You also need to know the appropriate approach for each type of person, a misguided person versus a person who is um, a false teacher. You may not be equipped to deal with a false teacher, but you can help a misguided person. So you need to know what kind of person it is and, and how to deal with them. And if you don't know whether they're a false teacher or they're a misguided person, then you would need to approach with caution. Uh, this past week I was in my backyard and I found a snake. Like I said, my daughter doesn't like snakes. All of actually, all of my hold on. Does anyone like snakes? I mean, (laughs) I don't have a problem with snakes. Actually, my wife called me because I picked the snake up in the backyard, (laughs) and she's like, "What were you doing?" I said, "I I picked up a snake," and she said, "Why?" (laughs) (laughs) That'd be my question. (laughs) Because it it was cool. It it was a cool looking snake. I was also thinking he's encountered two more snakes than I ever have in my life. So, (laughs) and it was a little snake. It was only like that big. It was a little garter snake. All right. But you need to know what kind of snake it is. If it was a, like a baby rattlesnake, right. which there are no rattlesnakes in Michigan, but if, if it was a baby rattlesnake, you definitely don't want to pick that up. And, and I think you need to know when you're going to engage a person, what kind of person is this? And if you don't know, it looks like if you didn't know what kind of snake it was, you either leave it alone or you approach cautiously. So you start asking questions. You find out how they're receptive to these things. And of course, false teachers are sneaky, so you have to be very cautious. So, you know, oftentimes it's best if you're a very immature believer to just, you know, inform a leader in the church and say, just like my kids would say, dad, there's a snake right there, deal with it. Hmm. Uh, they don't want to figure out whether it's a poisonous one or not. And, and that may be the best tact for a believer that's immature. And that's not a negative thing. We're all there. Some of us are less mature than others. And some of us have more maturity than others, but there's always stuff to learn. So you may have to go to somebody and say, um, this guy wants to do a Bible study. He said he knows our church and he knows you, but he doesn't come to our church. And he wants to do a Bible study at his house. And he's talked to several of us at this church. Well, what's his name? Yes, I do know that guy. And yes, he did come to our church. And yes, we did discipline him. He's a false teacher. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a good thing you told me. Let me tell you a little bit about him so you don't think we just, because he may tell you that the story that didn't happen. And then you, you engage them with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes we don't know. And so we approach cautiously. And I think we need to approach the whole situation full of prayer. We're not Gnostics. We don't believe that there's only some superior special knowledge that pastors have. We all have the word, we all have the spirit, and we all can depend on God in prayer. So whether it's a person who doesn't, uh, is just uh, misguided or whether it's a false teacher, it doesn't matter. All of us, as we approach these situations and people need to be saturated in prayer. Lord, help me. Because a misguided person, Um, You may not know the answers to their problems or whatever the situation is that they come to you. So you need to be coming full of prayer, dependent upon the Lord, that he would help you to remember what his word says for their situation. Same thing for a false teacher. A false teacher, though, is a different thing because it's a battle. You're actually engaging in spiritual battle. So you, you need the Lord in battle. A misguided believer isn't battle in that sense. So you're not coming against the enemy you're probably coming against one of the Lord's own. And so you need to come as a shepherd and a shepherd guides and directs. It doesn't, it doesn't hack with the sword. So it's a very different thing when we put it into those kind of terms, yeah. but, but you still need both need prayer because you're guiding them. Yeah. So you need to pray and ask the Lord, how should I approach the situation? How should I guide this brother? Yeah. yeah, I think your snake illustrations are very uh, effective <laughs> and, and just both from the standpoint of sometime you, you might need your pastor to help you identify what yeah. type of snake this is. And also, I like what you said about the, you know, when you saw the snake on the trail and you killed it for, so that the others coming yeah. behind you would not get bit by it. That that sounds like a pastor as well. Yeah. Someone who's willing to go out in front and identify false teachers and mark them off and warn everyone else yeah. uh, so that others aren't injured and swayed by their false teaching. Um, oh, I have one more question for you, Dr. Vargas. How yeah. can we grow in our discernment in identifying these groups, uh, the issues at hand and our responses to them? Well, I think I think the best way for us is to know the Word of God, yeah. to know it very, very well. I, I, a long time ago in another world, in another era, I, I, uh, I worked in a bank 
in downtown LA. And I noticed you still have the bank actually here. Uh, First Interstate yeah. Bank, uh, LA yeah. Main Central in the middle of downtown LA used to exist there. It actually caught fire one time. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a big, huge high rise. It, it it's, doesn't exist anymore in, in California, but it exists here for some reason in Nebraska. And uh, so I worked in the LA Main branch. And when I first started there, I was a teller. And that was the way that they trained you as a teller to identify counterfeit was you had to know the identifying marks of real money. And there's a lot of people. We had a big square in the center on the first floor, the main branch with tellers all the way around it. And so people are coming in from all directions, at, especially paydays on like a Friday in the middle of the day. It was just packed. And so everybody's working really quick and it's really easy to miss those indicators. And so you, you, don't, you aren't trained in all the counterfeiting methods because they always change. They, they might get better or worse, but they're always different. And they, they may counterfeit one thing over the other. And now today they're even better at doing what they do. Um, but they're always the same kind of methodologies. They're always something that they're trying to change. Like they'll clip the corners off of bills, off of a $1 bill, and they'll attach 20 corners off of four different $20 bills. Still can use the 20, but you can't use the one. So you put the 20 where it says 20 on the corners of your bill, a $1 bill, you give it to them. Well, if you know to look at the face of the yeah. bill, mm -hmm. you'll realize that's not a 20. Mm -hmm. But most people don't bother with that. All the bills need to face the same direction and they all need to be face up so that you are able to identify those things quickly. You feel the paper. Mm -hmm. You you know, nowadays they have the ribbons and holograms and all kinds of things. If you don't know the word of God really, really well, you won't know the counterfeit. And that means not just knowing how to, you know, a lot of people memorize Bible, which is great. But if you don't know the context of the Bible verse, cults all the time, false teachers all the time use the Bible yeah. out of context. If you use, a, look at a, an Awake magazine by the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Watchtower magazine, they have footnotes of Bible verses all over them. You go look up those verses, they don't prove what they're trying to say. And so you have to know not just the word of God, but it's context and it's major themes really well. When you do that, the false teachers can't really get by on that. You may not actually know how to answer them. That's a different skill that you build on that base, but they need to, you need to know the basics that goes for helping the misguided believer as well. That's a little easier task because the misguided believer will come and they'll have maybe some weird idea that they heard and you can go to the word and say, no, that's not, that's not what the Bible means. Are you sure? And then you can read it with them. And once they see the context, they'll go, oh yeah, that is, that isn't what it says. And you're helping them learn discernment, learn the Bible, learn that maybe the place they got it from was false teaching. So you're helping other people as well. But the Bible is the foundation. If they know the Bible, then they will be able to get over most challenges. After that, you can, you know, learn some apologetics stuff that which will be very helpful for that. But apologetics is nothing without the base, the foundation yeah. of the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Back to the foundation, right? Yeah. We're Bible men. Uh, we we serve Bible churches and you serve Bible fel you know, fellowship that is all about yeah. the scriptures and what an appropriate last word, you know, because uh, that that is what it comes down to. We're talking about discernment. We're talking about uh combating false teaching. We're talking about building up and, and redirecting misguided believers. Mm -hmm. We're nothing if we're not Bible people. And we, mm -hmm. we have nothing if we don't have the scriptures to point them yeah. to. And we're reminded that that is why God breathed out his word. Yeah. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, yep. for correction, for training up in righteousness. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what you said was very biblical. Yep. Well, Dr. Vargas, we appreciate you. We appreciate your ministry. Uh, you. You've been serving here this weekend at our Entrusted Conference. Uh, you just gave a great talk to some pastors and leaders on, on very similar precepts of standing on the truth of God's word. And that takes us right to what we do on the Sound Words podcast. We're all about helping Christians love and live out God's word. And the final word is always on the podcast goes to God and his word, where Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.13, Retain the standard of sound words, which you have heard from me in the faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Thanks for listening.